Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, I just put the finishing touches on the next video in the series for the CA2000 Sansui preamp. And, well, our friend showed up, <laughs> uh, the audio file, and kind of informed me that maybe some of what I'm saying might not make a lot of sense or anything. So what I'm going to do is I scrapped the entire video. And uh, you'll have to forgive the sound quality on this. It's going to vary a little bit because I'm using a fixed microphone right now on a stand. Uh, still working on getting parts of uh, the basement down here dried out. And they have all kinds of fans and dehumidifier, air cleaner things going. It sounds like an airport runway. <laughs> if you go to the other side of the basement here. Uh, so, trying to work around some of that. But anyway, uh, I decided to scrap the whole video and do something that's not 100% just related to this preamp. But it will be a really good lesson for all of us uh, for when we're talking about working with capacitors. And namely, the, the focus of this video is going to be can you replace an electrolytic capacitor in the audio path? We're talking, this is for audio, this is not, because there's a lot of different factors that affect this circuit-wise. But in, in an audio amplifier or a preamp or any audio frequency circuit, can you replace an electrolytic capacitor with a film capacitor and what effect will that have, if any? Does it matter? Or doesn't it matter? I think the one thing you'll read so much about on forums such as DIY Audio and Audio Karma and all these places, even Reddit, all these places, is, you know, you'll, you'll hear all kinds of things. And usually whoever makes the comment starts out by saying, I have done it for this for 40 years or 30 years or 50 years, and so I know it works. Well, you may have. <laughs> I've done a lot of things for a lot of years and later found out there's a better way to do it or there was something not right or not, uh, there's something more right or better way of doing than what I've been doing for 30 years. So that's kind of hard to always swallow that sometimes, that pride. But I'm going to tell you right up front, some of the things I'm going to tell you today are things that I have been doing differently and over the last two years have really changed my mind on. And this is why I want to share this all with you. And I'm going to, in great detail, explain why. Hopefully this will put an end to the debate. It won't. <laughs> but at least it will bring the debate to a different, maybe in a different direction from now on. So we can talk on it a more technical level than just saying it sounds worse or better or whatever. Very subjective things. You know me. I, I'm not just about being subjective because I'm going to have my own opinion on how things sound and so are you. But really, can we look at why? Why, why can we have different opinions? What, what is it that makes that? Okay, That's what I tend to, to explore in this video. Okay, what really started all this, and let me look at some things for a minute, and i got to make sure that uh, I'm going to set the microphone down here. I hope it picks it up and I can tweak it a little bit in the editing process, But because I don't have a shirt I can clip onto very easily. But really what started all this was I was replacing the capacitors, and yeah, another recap video is not something you all need here on the Internet. Okay. <laughs> There's a billion videos with people changing capacitors. It seems like that's the only thing that matters sometimes in these audio things, but well, enough about that. So if you look here, this amplifier, or this preamp is rather unique when you compare it. I'll try not to cover the microphone here. When you compare it to other circuits, because all throughout this amplifier, this preamp, I'll call it an amplifier, you have these non-polarized or bipolar electrolytic capacitors. 
can see one right there, but I'm getting shutter roll here on the video, but you can see they're all over the schematic. And why did they do that? You know, all the other ones, they're the same electronics, very similar circuit design, and most of the other ones out there, including Sansui, used polarized electrolytics. In addition, there's an argument that the reason people use electrolytics instead of film caps is because they were cheaper or they were smaller physically. And the more I work on this stuff, the more I totally disagree with that because I see a lot of situations where when these people were in this, they were in it to win it. They wanted to be the best. This wasn't about saving a nickel here and there. It was about getting the sales and getting in the audio magazines in the 1970s of being the best. They, they wanted, and they spared no expense. And the more you work on these things, the more you'll realize that. This wasn't always about economy, you know, and, and cost cutting. They, although they did do some of that, they had to, but that wasn't the main focus. So case in point, they never used film capacitors because they were expensive and large. Well, if you go here and I zoom you in, let's see here, what do you see on that board? It's loaded with big film capacitors. And if I go to the preamp board with, or for the phono stage that I've already recapped, look at that. Two great big two microfarad film caps. Why did they do that? Why couldn't they have just used a either a non-polarized electrolytic or even a polarized electrolytic? Why were certain caps in here non-polarized and other ones polarized? Like these are bipolar caps right here and down here. These are not. So we're going to answer all that. Uh, the other question that we have to answer is why are they using non-polarized versus polarized? Well, I think when we learn how a capacitor works, maybe we'll be able to answer that for ourselves. And to make this a little bit easier, the other evening when I was watching TV with my wife, I sat down at the computer and I literally put together out of, off the top of my head a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to use that to guide myself so I don't get off track. And uh, I'll put it up on the screen and then we'll flash back and forth to the bench here and kind of look at some of the things that we're talking about. So let's do that now. Okay, obviously this is <laughs> capacitor theory, but here's the thing. In order to know about a capacitor, we kind of have to understand things that are going to get into other things than capacitors like resistors and inductors. But the big thing we need to learn the difference of to start out is what is the difference between resistance, impedance, and reactance. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So if you look right here, here's a couple things you need to understand up front. Resistance. What is resistance? It's the measurement or the measure of opposition to current flow in an electrical circuit of direct current. Okay. Very important. Sometimes people call it DC resistance. But really, resistance is, you know, as a general rule, is related to DC or direct current, or at least is a representative resistance of direct current. Resistance is measured in ohms, and it has the omega symbol. And anybody that studied Ohm's law or anything like that, uh, we'll have an understanding of that. And yes, I have a bunch of little short videos I call electrical shorts. I never release them that deal with all of that, that starts you at the very beginning of an electron and builds into, uh, you know, a Coulomb and, you know, an ohm and a volt and an amp and a watt and a joule and so forth. I may release those one day. I'm not sure. Don't know how. I don't know. We'll see. All right, impedance now is a similar thing, okay? A lot of times we use the word impedance interchangeably with resistance, but really 
If you wanted to be strict about it, impedance is similar to resistance, but it's relative to a certain frequency in an AC circuit. So that means in order to really describe impedance, you're still going to describe it in ohms, but it's ohms at a certain frequency under certain conditions. So in other words, an impedance, for instance, of a speaker is 8 ohms. When they say your speaker is 8 ohms, <laughs> impedance, first of all, if you put a, well, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Okay, here's a speaker, and it says 8 ohms, and it says that it can go from 65 hertz to 10 kilohertz. We're not going to worry about any of that right now, but it's an 8 ohm speaker. Now let's see what it measures. Pretty close to 8 ohms, right? It's a little bit off. It's 7.37 ohms. But not every 8 ohm speaker will read with an ohm meter will read close to 8 ohms. Some of them will read 4 ohms. Some of them will read uh, a little above that. That's not <laughs> because they're telling you what the impedance, the average impedance. And this is going to be relative to a certain frequency or range of frequencies, if that makes sense. So if I take a different device, like this LCR meter. And let's see if I can get it set up here. Okay, so if you take a look right now, I have an LCR meter. And what this is, is this is going to measure, it's set to measure resistance but it's measuring the resistance at AC. It's actually measuring impedance right now because it's a 100, It's putting a 100 hertz tone and you can't really hear it in this. You might hear it if I put the mic right next to it. Hope you could hear that. And you can see at 100 hertz, it's actually more than eight ohms. It's 8.6 ohms. Do you see that? And remember with our with our meter, we measured seven point some ohms at DC. Let's change the frequency now. At 120 hertz, it's pretty similar, right? 8.42. Let's check one kilohertz. And now you can really hear it because this <laughs> it's a little bit louder. The speaker's doing a better job of projecting that sound. And look, it is now 8.4 ohms. And if I pick this up, it'll change. If I put it down, it'll change again. Do you see that? If I put my finger on the cone, it'll change. It goes more to its DC resistance again. You see what's happening? If I go to 10 kilohertz, all of a sudden our resistance or our impedance goes up to 20 ohms. See that? And if I go to 100 kilohertz, it goes to 71 ohms. So this is not the same as a resistor. And that therefore, that is why when we talk about 8 ohms, we're talking 8 ohms impedance. And what they're saying is it's an average of 8 ohms within its frequency range. Now, if I measure a tweeter, it's going to have a very different curve than this. Let's take a look at that. Okay, here is a mid-range with cat fur on it. <laughs> uh, you can thank Mango for that. Or thank uh, the ghost of Cookie, who, yes, she has left fur throughout our entire house. Anyway, it's just a Radio Shack mid-range. It's a four-inch mid-range. And once again, if you look very closely, it says 8 ohms. And I've switched the meter back to 100 hertz. And let's connect it up once again. And again, at 100 hertz, it's 7 ohms, about 
at 120 about the same 1 kilohertz now it goes up to 9 ohms see that the resistance or the impedance is actually increasing more on this mid range with frequency than with that other speaker and if i lift this up you can see it gets really loud let's flip this around if we can okay unfortunately i can't get rid of that noise now we're at 10 kilohertz and notice it's now 16 ohms I think it was the other speaker was around 20 and you're gonna see this is not gonna roll off as quickly and at 100 kilohertz instead of 70 ohms it's 50 ohms but remember both of these speakers were rated at 8 ohms 8 ohms is a nominal value and that's really the thing you need to understand and that's the difference between resistance and impedance if I look at the DC resistance of this speaker again see if I can get my meter in here without hitting the mic it's seven ohms seven and a half ohms so two things to remember DC resistance of a voice coil of a speaker is not the same as its impedance and second of all the impedance changes with frequency that's the all that's really the lesson we learned from this so having said all that what is reactance reactance is a way to describe the properties of impedance in a circuit so there's two different types of reactants. There's inductive reactants and capacitive reactants. Inductors have inductance <laughs> and capacitors have capacitive reactants. Duh. <laughs> yeah, I put that in there. The difference between the two is the phase angle between the voltage and current. And because the voltage and current in a reactor are not in phase, the reactor acts like an impedance in the circuit. Does that make sense? probably not so there's a little trick that we use in electronics to remember the difference between uh, inductive reactants and capacitive reactants and that is our good old friend Eli the ice man <laughs> so Eli ice where does that come from so Eli so with an inductor L the voltage which is E leads the current which is I so voltage leads current in an inductor Eli and in a capacitor it's the complete opposite so with a capacitor C the current I leads the voltage E so as a capacitor charges up when you first put a power source across that capacitor the current is going to, in a perfect world, current would be infinite. If you had a power supply that could supply infinite current and you had a perfect capacitor with no resistance or anything, no other properties, but it's just strictly capacitance, you would have infinite current in the beginning and then the capacitor would charge up and as the capacitor charges up, the current drops down and the voltage will start to increase. So as the capacitor charges, the current will go down, the voltage will go up until eventually they switch places and you will have all voltage, but there will be no current flow anymore because the capacitor is charged. The two different plates are charged. And unless anything affects that to m cause the charge to move from the one side of the capacitor to the other, it'll stay like that. An inductor is a complete opposite. Whenever you put a voltage across there, it's going to try to oppose that, that current. So you'll have all the voltage across there at first and no current will be flowing, but as, as the voltage reacts to that inductor, the, you'll get a magnetic field within that coil and that magnetic field will start to collapse. And as it collapses, 
you start to see the resistance of that wire, the DC resistance of that wire in the coil, and it's eventually, it can't hold anymore, and your current is going to start going up, and your voltage is going to start going down. And eventually, at the end, the, the only determining factor in that inductor will be the DC resistance of, of the wire that makes up the coil of, you know, of that inductor. And so your voltage will be equal to the DC resistance, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever the DC resistance is going to be in that inductor, okay? Plus the, you know, with the, using Ohm's law with the amount of current flowing through it. So again, they trade places. You have a high voltage and low current, and in the end you have low current and high voltage, or I mean high voltage and low current, and in the end you have high current and low voltage across the coil. They're like yin and yang. They work together with one another. And we can get more into theory with that later when we talk, when you talk about, um, you know, tank circuits and resonant circuits and things, but that's not what this video is about. It's about capacitors. But you really need to know this concept or you'll never understand. And I think that's why a lot of people don't understand why different capacitors are important and why they each affect the circuit differently. It's because of the reactive properties and some of the other properties we're going to learn about within the capacitor. Now the world isn't perfect. <laughs> there is no such thing as an absolute perfect capacitor or an absolute perfect inductor and therefore <clears throat> you will see that every component, so these capacitors, will also have some resist DC resistive property to them. It'll have some inductive properties. It'll have obviously have capacitive properties and it'll have some other things mixed in there and we'll talk about those as we go along. And it's this imperfect world syndrome <laughs> that causes different types of capacitors to be more or less suitable for different types of circuits. Now what parameters affect a capacitor and how it works, okay? Well, the components that are used to make the capacitor are one of the things that can do it. So some types of caps are made out of film. So, you know, those are those green ones we just looked at in the, in the earlier clip there. Uh, you have electrolytic capacitors, ceramic, paper and foil, tantalum, they're all different materials and really the whole idea of a capacitor is you have to have an insulator and two electrodes, you know, separated by an insulator and there's different ways that, that different methods we use to achieve that. The strangest one is the electrolytic capacitor because it uses chemicals to create those uh, insulators and the conductors that, you know, what, what we call the dielectric. And that's really separates an electrolytic capacitor quite a bit from your foil and paper caps and your ceramic caps. Now, for the sake of audio use, we're going to focus on the two caps, the film and the electrolytic, which is going to be film caps like this and like the green ones that are up, you know, like these ones here. These are film capacitors. These are film capacitors. These little green ones are film capacitors. Okay. These are called polypropylene capacitors. They're they're similar to a foil or a film capacitor, but they they have a little bit different materials they use for the insulators and so forth. And then we're going to so we're going to talk about film and we're going to talk about electrolytic. Those are the two main ones we're going to focus on because th this is really the main crux of this video is can't what happens when we substitute one for the other. Next thing we're going to talk about is ESR, equivalent series resistance. And that's a huge one, especially when we're talking about electrolytic capacitors. So ESR is an internal resistance value that's defined in ohms that is a result of the components making up that capacitor. It isn't an actual resistor. So it's not a resistor, but it acts as if it's a resistor. So it affects the capacitor as if there were a resistor placed in series with it. 
So EXR is extremely low with film capacitors, but when you look at an electrolytic, it can be, it can be significant. And I'll show you that right now, real quick. Okay, I have two capacitors. They're both 10 microfarads at 63 volts. So you can see this one here, 10 microfarads at 63 volts. And you can see this one here, 10 microfarads at 63 volts. Hopefully you can see it. All right, this one is a film capacitor. This one is an electrolytic capacitor. So let's connect up the electrolytic. And I am testing this at 1 kilohertz right now. But we should really test ESR at 100 kilohertz. That's another thing is ESR is just the standard reference because, again, impedance and all that stuff affects it. Your standard test for ESR is 100 kilohertz. And ESR changes with frequency. So it's another moving target. That's We'll get into that later in, in this in this video. But here we go. And let's change it to ESR. And you can see the ESR right now is 1.41 ohms. And our 4.7 or our 10 microfarad capacitor <laughs> is only reading like a 5 microfarad capacitor, isn't it? And that's because the ESR is interfering with the meter's ability to test capacitance. So it makes the capacitor in this circuit act like it's only 5 ohms. It's half of what's rating. So if you were to use this in a circuit that has the same, puts the same load and frequency as this meter does, this capacitor would not act like a 10 microfarad capacitor. It would act like a 5 microfarad capacitor or a 4.94 microfarad capacitor. And it's because of this ESR among other things. Now if we connect up this film cap, you can see it still drops in capacitance at 100 kilohertz. Not as bad, but it still drops. But if, look at the ESR. It's only 20 milliohms tiny compared to what this one was. And it is these properties that make these two capacitors different, even though they're both rated at 10 microfarads and both rated at 63 volts, that it doesn't tell you the whole story. And I think this is where people get hung up. People look at, you know, old electrolytic capacitors fail with age, they leak, they get they go bad. But if I put this film cap in, I'll never have to replace it again. They're better. Well, yes, in this instance, if this one, if, if this is what you want, this is better than this. There's reasons why we might want it to be like this. We're going to talk about that later. That's where we're going to end with all this. Now, another thing with capacitors is leakage. And just like ESR is like a equivalent resistor that would be put in series with the cap, okay, so it'd be like, kind of like something like this. So it'd be kind of like this, having a resistor in series with the capacitor. That's ESR, that's what ESR is. But leakage is similar to, well, it's a property in a capacitor that causes it to discharge, even when there's no ch change in voltage being applied to the capacitor. So it acts like a resistor that's being placed in parallel with the capacitor. In other words, you know, kind of like this, where you have, have it across the capacitor like that instead of in series with it. And of course, what's that going to do? That's a load. It's going to drain the capacitor. Now, leakage is really, really a high value usually, but electrolytics have a, you know, they have a tendency to, as they go bad, that leakage will go up, 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 up until, you know, the cap will short. They can short out. So again, film capacitors usually have a very, very low leakage, but paper foil caps and electrolytic caps can develop significant amount of leakage as they age. So 
maybe we can see this with our little meter. Let's look at that. Okay, what I have here is a capacitor leakage meter, and this is a brand new cap that's formed up and it's working properly. And it's this is the electrolytic one, and you can see it's literally microamps of leakage. So there's only about two microamps or one microamp of leakage current on that cap, which is a very good. And you'll see that as caps age, the, that will get worse and worse and worse. Now here's a crusty old paper can electrolytic. And this is an electrolytic capacitor. And it's only one microfarad, but I actually had to change the scale. <laughs> it's off the scale in the highest sensitivity. So we're right now looking at about 60 microamps of leakage current right now on that cap. And, that's, and it's never going to reform. It is what it is. That, that capacitor is shot. Now switching to our film cap, as you can see here. I turn that on you see how fast it goes and if I go to the most sensitive there is zero that's unmeasurable leakage it's not measurable and that's the biggest difference between a film capacitor and an electrolytic capacitor and that film capacitor if I come back 20 years from now and do this same test it will still do that this electrolytic capacitor, if I use it for long enough, over a number of years, that will that will start to grow. I mean, it'll it's right now is you know one or two microamps, but it will go up and up and up as time progresses. That's just how an electrolytic works. So it changes its properties with age. It's like tires on your car; the treads wear down when you drive it. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is ESL, or equivalent series inductance. Yes, in a capacitor, you can have inductance. It's going to be, most caps, the way they're designed, it's going to be really, really tiny. But, even the tiniest amount of inductance is going to have a big influence on the signal when you have very, very high frequencies. So the higher the frequency of the circuit, the more the ESL, even though it's a tiny amount, is going to affect it. ESL is hard to measure because it's very, very small. So it does make a difference. And I notice sometimes I'm holding the mic close so the, it distorts a little bit. I don't have compression or anything connected to it yet. But anyway, so again, it's not an actual inductor, but it's a parasitic effect that acts like an inductor being in series with that capacitor. So even, even the lead of a capacitor, you know, the, the little wire right here, you know, these leads, they act as little inductors. This is a, p a piece of wire can be an inductor. This is gonna have very low inductance, but it's still an inductor nonetheless. So the combination of all these things will affect the capacitor's ability to make current lead the voltage by exactly 90 degrees, right? So again, in a capacitor, the current will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. Okay, so if we look at the, uh, I'll see if I can get a, a little example of that picture and I'll pop it up on the screen here if I remember. And the more that these parameters come into effect, the more, the further away from that perfect capacitor you're going to be. So current and voltage are not going to be an exactly timed, you know, 90 degrees out of phase thing. So you have to remember that. And that's where we're going to get into this next part when we talk about capacitor parameters. So first one we're going to talk about is dissipation factor. What is dissipation factor? Well, dissipation factor is the ratio between the ESR and the actual amount of capacitive reactants in the capacitor. So again, capacitive reactants is measured in ohms, you know, at certain frequencies and so forth. And that's normal. That is a normal function of the capacitor. That's the good impedance. That's the good ohms value we want to talk about. But ESR 
is the bad ohms because it's counteracting the effect of that reactor to be a reactor, you know, to be a proper capacitor. So the ratio between the ESR and the amount of capacitive reactants is the dissipation factor. And it's a percentage value and it'll vary with frequency and how close to or far away from resonance the capacitor is. So really there's a lot of things that change you know, where dissipation factor will change. Again, it's a moving target. That's why you won't see a capacitor data sheet just list a dissipation factor. If they talk about it, they're going to also set up the scenario, you know, how many, you know, what frequency it's operating at and so forth, because that affects the dissipation factor. At lower frequencies, we define the effect as a capacitor's loss tangent. Okay, so loss tangent is the amount measured in degrees, you know, the amount of difference there is from that perfect minus 90 degrees. So you, you want that voltage to be 90 degrees lagging behind the current. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied here. And if, if it's not exactly minus 90 degrees or a minus 90 degree difference, it's going to tell you in percentage. And I'm going to show you that on another piece of test equipment here in a little bit. And this is really good for lower frequencies, like when you're talking about an electrolytic capacitor or, you know, lower frequency circuits, you're going to measure it in loss tangent or delta loss. There's a couple different ways that they, you know, they have tangent and that little symbol sigma, I think that is. The, all those things, they all mean the same thing. Now, that number can get a little bit unwieldy and not as accurate um, when you're dealing with super high frequencies. So like when you're dealing with a ceramic capacitor or a film capacitor, you're usually going to measure it as a Q value or a quality factor. And all it is is the inverse of loss tangent. So if you take that loss tangent and you know you take one over that, that's your Q factor. So really loss tangent and Q are the same thing, they're just looking at it in different ways. It's kind of like looking at a linear scale versus a logarithmic decibel scale. So you can look at a scale in dB, which allows you to have a big amount of, you know, just allows you to have a, a big amount of data in a short scale. Or you could have the linear scale, which is, this, you're still looking at the same data, you're just looking at it stretched out over, you know, a big chart, you know, a big graph. So that's the difference between loss tangent and Q. Just different ways of looking at the same property. Now, a couple more notes about ESR. First of all, the ESR of a capacitor will change with frequency. And you saw that when we used our LCR meter. It'll decrease with increases of frequency and it will increase with decreases in frequency. So they move opposite directions. The change in ESR versus frequency is greater in electrolytic capacitors than it is in film capacitors. Again, we saw that on our LCR meter. And the measured capacitance of an electrolytic capacitor, or even the film cap, but in an electrolytic, it will decrease much more rapidly with increase in frequency than it will in a film capacitor. And even more so, you know, it's more dramatic in a ceramic cap. You know, when you talk about ceramic and you talk about the um, silver mica capacitors, they, they are really solid throughout a, a big range of frequencies, even into very high frequencies, they can operate and not change their value. That's why different versions of caps are different for different circuits. Because of these factors, you have to remember to choose the correct cap. And that's what it's all about. And that's the end of the little thing that I have, a little PowerPoint. So let's look at something else now. Okay. Let me zoom you in to something that you probably aren't going to see. See that little blue light in the middle of the screen right here with the two leads coming out of it? That is called a DATS. It's made by Dayton Audio, D-A-T-S. 
and you can buy them on Dayton Audio. That one is the version 3. There's a version 2. I don't think it's available anymore. And it really allows you to do a lot of different tests when it comes to audio related electronics. I'll just put it that way. It's, it could do a whole video series on that itself. But let's look at the software that it uses. So here it is. And we can connect capacitors up to it and we can actually test what the capacitor, how it performs. So I'm going to connect this up like so. Well, there. <laughs> Just connect it to the leads. Now the leads and everything have to be calibrated and the, the device has to be calibrated. That's all done. This isn't about the dats, it's about the data. <laughs> so if I do a test, the capacitor test, and you can see down here there is a capacitor test. It's going to do a whole bunch of things at once. It's, first of all, it's going to sweep a signal from about 5 hertz to about 20 kilohertz. And then it's going to read back all of those parameters at those frequencies. So let's do it. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of stuff here you're going to see. And I know some of you cannot see the, the cursor. I should probably choose a different cursor size, but there it is moving around. If you look behind here, let me move this out of the way for a minute. You see this graph. There's a red line, and the red line right here, it tells you what the phase angle relationship is between voltage and current at a certain frequency. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, the scale starts at 5 hertz, goes up to 20 kilohertz, and it shows you, or on the right hand side, it's showing you how many degrees off of 90 it is. The zero degrees would be a straight piece of wire. So if there is no reactance involved, there would be no phase angle difference between the voltage and the current. But in a capacitor, remember, we want it to be minus 90 degrees. And in an inductor, it's always going to be plus 90 degrees. And if you look, minus 90 is here. It kind of holds around there most, most of the way. And so you can see that it changes with frequency. So it'll kind of dip down close to that 90 degree mark when you're, you know, in the 1 kilohertz down to, you know, clear down to about 30 hertz, 20 hertz. But as you get higher and lower frequency, you can see that phase angle changes, and that's the influence of all those things I was talking about, the ESR, the ESL, you know, dissipation factor, you know, your Q factor, whatever. And you can see that in this chart. And the other thing is the impedance, which is the resistance relative to a certain frequency. That's the blue line. And you can see at 5 hertz, it's acting like about like a 3K resistor. It has 3,000 ohms of impedance. But at 20 kilohertz, it's passing the signal right through, and you're down below 2 ohms, close to 1 ohm. And what that's showing you is this is what we call a high pass filter. That's what a capacitor does. It's supposed to attenuate a signal as the frequency decreases. So at DC, it should totally block. It should be infinite ohms. And at a certain frequency, it's going to be close. It will start to approach zero ohms. It'll just act like a dead short. It'll let the signal pass right through. That's the whole point of a capacitor. It's, it's a high pass filter. That's why we call it high pass. Because obviously, at high frequencies, if the resistance is very low, it's going to pass most of the signal through. It's not going to affect it. But at very low frequencies, that impedance or resistance relative is very, very high. And you're, it's like putting a resistor of that value at that frequency in series with whatever circuit you're driving, right? And this will be a very adversely affected by the load that you connect to it. You know, when you put a different load on there, it's going to cause different effects.
I think that's the easiest way to put it, I guess. But if you look at this chart, you can see its average capacitive value is 10 microfarads because it's a 10 microfarad capacitor. But you can see that the ESR, as you go to you know different frequencies, it changes. So you have like at 100 hertz, it's about 10 ohms, it's saying, or 120 hertz, I'm sorry, it's about 10 ohms. And at one kilohertz, it's two ohms. And at 10 kilohertz, it's 1.7 ohms. Same thing with dissipation factor and Q, they're, they're the same. So if you take 0.1419, which is 14.19%, and you take the inverse of that, one over that, you get 7.047. And what's it say? 14.19%, 7.047 Q factor. Just like we were talking. The tangent, loss tangent, or the delta, is 8 degrees. So that means that if we look at one kilohertz, you are eight degrees off of minus 90, so you should be somewhere around uh, minus 82 degrees, or negative 82 degrees. So there's an 82 degree phase angle between the voltage and current uh, at one kilohertz on this capacitor. Now let's take this off and put this on. So now we're looking at the film cap. It's the same, again, 10 microfarad, 63 volts, same rating. Go over here. Let's test it again. And you can see our numbers are a bit different, aren't they? Uh, that phase angle is a lot flatter. You look at the red line, it's a lot closer to the negative 90 all the way across the board. And you can see uh, the ESR is much, much lower. As a matter of fact, when you get up to 10 kilohertz, it's a quarter, about a quarter of an ohm, maybe. And you could see the loss angle is very small, 1.2 degrees. So it's more like 88 degrees. <laughs> and so it's close to 90 degrees. And that is the pretty substantial difference. Now, I would argue that in a circuit of low impedance where you know you're causing a lot of ripple current to be drawn through the capacitor those factors are going to make a big difference whereas in a extremely high impedance circuit that doesn't cause a lot of current to flow through the resist through the capacitor you would see less difference therein is where the problem lies and you have to look at the value of the cap. You have to look at the impedance of the circuit or of the load that's being attached to it. And you can see very quickly where having one versus the other would make a difference on what your signal looks like after it passes through that capacitor. And that's why you can't just swap out one for the other. It will have an effect. Okay, so I am gonna stop right here for this video because I think this kind of this is a lot of stuff to digest but I'm gonna bring it all together on the on part two of the Sansui CA2000 uh, preamp video you can see I've already made a uh, modified schematic with notes it's kind of tiny and hard to see but we're gonna go over that and you're gonna see that they used three different you know, multiple different types of capacitors in there, including non-polarized electrolytics, standard uh, electrolytics, standard low noise electrolytics, and the, uh, the film capacitors. And we're going to kind of look at where they used them in the circuit and maybe talk a little bit about why. And uh, hopefully we'll all understand why we should probably, when we recap these things, use similar capacitors to what they had. Because a lot of thought went into this thing, and I'm really excited to talk about this preamp because
there's some pretty interesting circuit design features in here that you don't see very often and that, that I think it's going to be make for a very interesting uh, circuit analysis. So until next time, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again here real soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.